Hey there, Susie here. Before we get into today's episode, I want to share this special message with you. Now, my co-host Michelle and I love masterminds. Not only do we belong to masterminds, but we also host a mastermind. We started it almost eight years ago, and it is the premier mastermind for women business owners who want to grow their business with a specific focus on marketing. Now, this group is usually completely booked out, and very occasionally we open the doors and invite a handful of women in. So if you're growing your business, but you're struggling with feeling overwhelmed, or like you constantly have a split focus when it comes to your marketing, this could be exactly what you're looking for. We have an amazing time together and the women in the group are extraordinary. They're great cheerleaders, supporters, advisors and colleagues for you. And they're also seeing extraordinary results. We see people cracking the million dollar, two million dollar, three million dollar mark, launching new e-commerce sites that go from zero to ten thousand dollars a month in sales. They're doubling their conversion rates, they're growing memberships, they're selling courses, they're growing their personal brands, and they're getting all kinds of media exposure and speaking opportunities and so much more. You can learn more about the Mastermind and join the wait list over at herbusinessmastermind.com. We're going to open the doors soon, so you definitely want to be on the list to get an invitation. So head on over to herbusinessmastermind.com. Create content that attracts, converts, and keeps your ideal clients. This is Content Cells. Hi, you're listening to the Content Cells podcast, the show all about how to create content to attract, convert, and keep your ideal clients. Welcome to episode 79. I'm Susie Daphnis, and here with me is my co host, Michelle Falzan. Hey, Michelle, how are you? I am great. Hello, Susie. It's good to be here today. I'm I'm loving the interview we're doing today. It's with a great friend who's doing some incredible work helping people understand what real influence looks like and how they can have more of it. So I'm super excited. I'm also doing great and I'm looking forward to this episode because I think this is a really important topic for our listeners because you can influence whether you're a big business, a small business, a one-person operation, a multinational, really important subject. So I want to thank you for joining us today. As Michelle said, we have a wonderful episode planned and a very special guest who's going to be on in just a moment. Her name is Julie Masters of juliemasters.com and she also heads up the Inside Influence podcast and she's going to be sharing with us her insight on how we can create more influential content that not only reaches our ideal customers, but also changes their hearts and minds. Mm, right, because that's really what influence is. The dictionary defines, I had to look this up, I thought, what is the official meaning? I love to get back to the root meaning of a word, <laughs> and if we're going to be talking about it a lot, and the dictionary defines influence as the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. Isn't that cool? The character development or behavior. I love that because it doesn't say anything right. about unethical or, you know, sometimes the word influence can be mm. misconstrued. So I love that mm. you defined it. Yeah, you know, and, and when we're creating strategic content, it is by its very nature needing to be influential. We're wanting someone to take a specific ba- action or do a specific behavior based on what they read or watch or see. So whether that's something something as simple as clicking on a link or as profound as making a life-changing decision, because sometimes that's what we're influencing mm. people to do. You know, all of this is part of what we're doing with our content. So Julie is someone who has studied influence for more than 15 years. And she's not only studied it, Susie, but what I love is she's lived it as well. And over that time, she's been the secret weapon behind some hugely successful influences. In fact, it could be said that Julie has built her career building influences. Mm. So she's the founder of Ode Management, and that's the world's largest dedicated speaker management agency with offices across Australia and the USA. She's now the founder and CEO of Influence Nation, working with business leaders and organizations on amplifying their influence through thought leadership. And over her 15-year history as a leading authority in the speaking world, she's earned a bit of a reputation for launching and advising some of the world's most respected influencers. And her clients include industry-leading CEOs, speakers, authors, media personalities, who I'm sure everybody would know if if we were able to reveal their names, (laughs) Mm. the voices of which have reached millions of people across the globe through speaking and publishing. And she's also won, you know, she knows what she's talking about. She's won numerous communication industry awards throughout USA, Australia, Europe. She spends her time now regularly advising entrepreneurs and executive teams on on really how to earn prominence 
in their marketplace by turning their expertise into influence. And her clients include LJ Hooker, KPMG, realestate.com.au, Goldwell, Ella Bache, to name a few. And she is someone you definitely want to listen to when it comes to being more influential in your space and in your content marketing. Well, I love that we're able to map over her experience with those really big brands to smaller businesses, which are the ones typically listening to this show. So this ability to influence is so central to successful content marketing. And if you're a long-time listener of the show, you're going to know that we are big fans of helping you speak, write, and create other forms of content that have the power to influence, to change minds, <laughs> as we said mm. earlier. And we've spoken many, many, many times on a book that we consider to be a must read for any marketer. And that's the book Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Dr. Robert Cialdini. It was written now over 20 something years ago. And so this is a topic that you want to know about and you want to put into practice this idea of being really clear on how you influence and how to influence. And If you keep listening after the interview, which I really encourage you to do, we've got a link to a special download gift from Julie that you're going to want to get access to. So more on that after the interview. We are thrilled to have Julie here with us today. So let's head over now and get her on the line. Welcome to the Content Sales Podcast, Julie Masters. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Both Susie and I are very much looking forward to our chat today. (laughs) Now, I'm going to dive right in because there are so many things that I want to pick in your magnificent brain. And the first question that I've got for you is, by the way, I've loved tuning in to your new podcast, Inside Influence. It is an absolute corker. Congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. It's, I mean, you guys have been doing this. How many episodes have you been doing this for now? Oh, we're up to this 79. This one's up to 79, yeah. <laughs> you see, yeah, I think I'm up to 14. I feel like I've just started kindergarten with this whole thing, so thank you. <laughs> and Susie's done hundreds of other podcast episodes as well. She's definitely a master. <laughs> but I get it. It's. I hope you fall in love with it as much as I did when I started back, back in the day. I think it's... It's one of those funny things, isn't it, where you, I think of the ones that I recorded initially, I've only used 50% of them. And every time I finish one, I think, oh God, did I really, did I say that? Did I really forget to turn the mic on? Did I? (laughs) So yeah, I'm I'm feeling like, I'm glad to be spending time with you both because I'm feeling like an utter novice and just getting it out there as a, as an an act of contribution and art right now, actually. I'm really trying to keep it framed in my head as a, as a piece of art. Mm, well, it's really, really showing in the content that you're putting out there. I truly, I, I'm not just saying this. I have It is in my top five podcasts that I listen to at the moment. It is just really great. And I love meeting all the wonderful people you've been interviewing, some out-of-the-box choices that I think other people will enjoy listening to. And one of the things I've loved about the podcast is how far you've stretched the edges of what our perception of influence is. So we thought a great place to start this interview would be to ask you to give us your definition of what influence is? Oh, it's a really great question. It's a really, why it's a great question is I've been working in this field for a couple of decades now and I am feel like I'm only just getting close to the answer. Mm. I think that the, the primary definition of influence is to have a compelling impact on something or someone. I think that would be my my primary definition. And the reason I keep that so open is because there's there's three different forms of influence. One I would call inside influence, which is the name of the podcast. And inside influence is how you influence your own brain. And you guys would know when you work with enough influential people or enough powerful people, you start to notice that what makes them that way starts out with how they influence their own mind mm. and how they influence their own rituals and behaviors and habits. And, you know, we all have this beautiful ability to be able to derail ourselves at at pretty much every turn and how they handle that. So there's that, there's inside influence. Then there's interpersonal influence. How do you handle difficult situations? How do you handle asking for a pay rise? How do you handle negotiations? How do you handle it when you have to stand up in front of multiple people and speak? So there's that form of influence. And then the third one is industry influence which is how do you stand out as the go-to person of choice in your space, in your, in your particular area of expertise? So all of those, I would say, to come back to the original question, was your ability to have a compelling impact on something or someone. 
Mm, it's wonderful. And one thing that uh, I'd love to just explore a little further or bounce off that definition is why is it so important? Because I think we've, we've been hearing more and more that it's important to become an influencer in our space, that third kind of influence you're talking about, industry influence. But why is it so important for us to become an influencer in our space, especially if, you know, I install pools or I am a life coach or I help people learn how to buy the right clothes for their wardrobe? Why is that so important for me to become an influencer in my space? I think we've got to start with the definition of, of influencer there because you're right. You, it's one of those words that gets chucked around a lot at the moment. You know, everybody wants to be an influencer from from internet stars, Instagram stars to, you know, dancing cats. There are some <laughs> pets that have more influence than all of us combined, which is just depressing. <laughs> so it does pay to get really clear first up on what is my, my own definition of an influencer, and that is to be the go-to expert in your space. And that's always been the case. You know, you've always had to be the go-to expert in your space. It just so happens that previous to now, that was done by word of mouth. You know, you'd, you'd ask your neighbour or you'd go to the local post office and have a look at the cards on the wall. You're looking for a go-to expert on something. We all do it in pretty much to meet all of our needs. So what's changed now is that the media has become, or the mediums that we have access to, they've become what I would call democratized. And so up until now, we had access to very small amounts of, of content. We had like newspapers, we had a few channels, then we had a few more channels, we had some radio stations. Now that particular power pyramid, which was other people controlled the messages that we received and how frequently we received them, that has turned upside down now. And human beings are now the most powerful force on the planet. And what I mean by that is if you wanted to start your own TV station, you can and go get a YouTube channel. If you want to start your own newspaper, you can. There are more blogs published every day than there are newspapers in the world. If you want to start your own radio station, start a podcast. You know, we have access now to more attention, more connection, and more influence than, in some cases, governments. And that's a scary thought. You know, I was talking to somebody recently about that, Leonard Brody, for my podcast, and he was saying, you know, it's a bit like the Spider-Man principle, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm. And to go back to your question, the other reason why it's really, really important is that we, the other shift that we've seen, so when I first started out in this industry, there were very few gurus. You know, there was a guru of leadership. There was the, the guru of real estate, the guru of investing, the guru of fashion. Now there are thousands, thousands and thousands. The other thing that's become really important is that 96%, the last time I looked, 96% of everything that we consume from a content point of view, so basically everything that we allow to influence us from information to stories, 96% of it is unbranded. So as human beings, we no longer pay any attention to brands. We pay very little attention to brands. And most of the corporations that I work with are really struggling with that. You know, we don't, if I looked at your Instagram feed, if I looked at what you're reading, if I looked at the people you're following, 96% of it has nothing to do with a brand. And so how do you, how do we handle that as business owners, as people trying to make a living? We spend $50 billion, I think, a year on marketing and advertising for brands on behalf of brands. And yet no one's looking, nobody's really watching, and certainly not many people are, are being influenced by it. So I think those two things combined, we have more access now than ever before, so there is more noise than ever before. And the fact that we follow human beings, we don't follow brands, has created this perfect storm where to stand out as an influencer in your space, a human face to your brand is more important, if vital, if you're going to get the market share that you're looking for. In a moment, I want to ask you about some of the things that our listeners can be doing right now to be more influential. But a question has just come to mind as I've been listening to you speak, and that is, is an influencer something that it's something that someone calls us like is it a bit like what your brand is is what the perception is of the public similarly and I'm an influencer because I say I am or because others name me an influencer it's a it's a very <laughs> good question because I think you know we all know people who you know the first thing they do out of the out of the gates is call themselves an influencer mm-hmm <laughs> 
I that's why that I asked. Ulti- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that ultimately, like anything else in a democratic, free access, you know, marketplace, you can say all you want about yourself. And, and it's really important to do that. I mean, I joke about it, but, you know, if you're not going to say the words, if you're not going to claim that space, then no one else is going to do it for you. But what it boils down to uh, over time is your brand, your influence is what, what other people say about you when you're not in the room. Mm. And I think it was Steve Jobs that said that that initially. So what do, mm. so some of the measures to speak to your question, you know, what are some of the measures? How do you know, other than the fact that you said it, how do you know that it's true? I think the clearest litmus test for that is influence has become the ability to say, look over there and have people engaged enough to look. And a brand has become what they look at. Now, the brand had better be good. The brand had better be, you know, compelling and interesting and it had better live up to whatever its brand promises. But brands are no longer what we find compelling. We find human beings compelling. You know, you've only got to look at the rise of reality TV Mm. out of all, you know, proportion to, to see, you know, what it is that we follow and what it is we find interesting. So are you engaging enough that when you say look over here do people look when you ask a question across any of your platforms how many people answer Mm. it's the echo effect is what comes back to you when you put something out there that is probably the truest sense of your influence So this show is all about using content to influence. And so whether that's one of our listeners wants to create a more influential sales presentation or write better headlines or create a more influential webinar or blog post or a Facebook ad, what are some of the things that we can be doing right now to have our communications be more influential? I think from a content perspective, one of the the biggest mistakes that I see getting made is not learning the language of your target. You get these incredible minds with this incredible experience and all this information to share and they use their own language to share it. And every space has a language, right? You know, real estate has its own language. My husband works in in the kind of real, real estate slash finance space. There's a very specific language that goes on there. And what we tend to do is we tend to share using the language that we know rather than going out into our target space and going, what language are they using? There's this beautiful phrase called charismatic language and every space has its own charismatic language. And, you know, real estate, the word dominate in real estate, you know, if you say the word dominate in any article title aimed at real estate agents and it will get read because that is just the charismatic language for that space. Whereas if you use dominate to a nursing community, they're probably not going to read it. <laughs> or our community, it would be. What? Oh, yeah, or your community. So it's it's go out there. I mean, there's amazing tools now that, you know, you guys would, would use and know about and no doubt talk about things like BuzzSumo where you can actually go, you know, what are the most frequently asked questions in my space? And then start looking. What's the language that gets used? What's the What are the questions that are getting asked? And then you run your expertise through that filter when it comes to article titles, when it comes to webinars, when it comes to any type of of breaking your expertise down into compelling content. Awesome. Great. So one of the things that we teased about a little earlier on is that you have provided an amazing gift for all our listeners that we're going to give them details of later on. But I want to give them a little bit of a sneak peek because in that – you talk about the five dis- disruptions, excuse me, that are fueling a lot of the changes around what it takes to be an influencer. Could you give us a little bit of an insight or one or two of those that might be good for us to know about? Sure, sure. Well, we talked about we talked about access. Mm. I talked about access before. So access has completely shifted. For the first time in history, we all have access to pretty much every media tool known to man. Which meant that, that, which means that the amount of noise that is out there that we now have to compete with is huge. So that's the that's the first one. Another one is trust. So what's happening is the people we're trusting is changing. Like ninety two percent of consumers trust an industry influencer more than an advertisement now. So we're getting way more savvy with where we place our trust. We don't trust adverts anymore. We have a huge barometer when it comes to, you know, being able to pick up on adverts. If you notice how advertising has shifted, it's gone from adverts to sponsorships to endorsements, but we can smell it now. We can smell when someone's paid to put a message out there. 
So trust has changed. And, and not only that, but I'm, as a mother, I would, which makes no logical sense to me at all, but I would literally rather, not rather, but 2 a.m. in the morning, Google what's wrong with my child and listen to some random lady who lives in Arkansas. I'd rather take her advice <laughs> than I would go to the World Health Organization or, heaven forbid, make a doctor's appointment. So it, it, somehow how and who we trust has completely shifted. And I was talking to a guy called Leonard Brody about this recently, and he was saying, I think it's that we are 75%, no, we spend 75% of our time as our virtual identity now. Mm. So 75% of the time that we spend with our colleagues, our family and our friends is as our virtual identity. And we are, I can't remember the percentage, but it's a crazy percentage more trusting in our virtual identity. You wouldn't hand out a picture of your young child to a stranger on the street, but you would post it on Facebook. Mm, that's so such we, an interesting observation. Yeah. So we are so much more in one sense, we are so much more trusting now. And in the other way, we are so much less trusting when it comes to brand messages, paid messages. Mm. So that's been a massive shift in, again, who we follow, who we listen to, who we go to for advice. So that's another one of them. Mm, Thank you. I think that the, the shift in generations has been a huge one. If you look at how we attract talent now, the majority of new generations, they want to work for the thought leader in their space. They want to work. They no longer want to work for their biggest, you know, they want to work for the ones on the cut, cutting edge, the the smaller team with the amazing ideas, the ones who are making, you know, compelling videos, who are writing the best articles, who are really driving conversations forward. So if you want to attract talent, the best talent, then becoming an influencer in your space is one of the fastest, fastest ways to do that. And another one is, is just pure growth. You know, there's two pathways you can take when you're growing a business and you know one is to chase business which is sometimes anyone that's run a business is sometimes very necessary but a far smarter strategy when you look at your time and resources is to attract business is to put ideas out there tools out there and that's exactly why you guys put together this amazing podcast to help people do that to put expertise out there that is going to attract business to you it's a far nicer smarter more joyful way to do business. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I, I I like to say that when you put that information out there, and it's information that I know Susie's passionate about, that I'm passionate about, so it's, it's a win-win. I get to put this great information out there, conjure my thoughts and ideas into some format that is satisfying for me, but it's also in service to other people. And then they just want to come on the journey with us. And it's sort of when you do this part right – there's no gimmicks. There's no salesiness. There's, it's just the natural next step is, oh, well, you've been watching my video on how to do this. Do you want to come and do my course? It costs this. And sure, I'd love to do that because I'm up to this point now where I'm ready for this next piece of information. And it's just a natural next step for people. I think it comes from a place of, you know, I talk to a lot of CEOs who want to get out there more and build their their brand presence and build them, build up in their spaces as a thought leader. And the the one thing that they, every single one of them, no matter male, female, how large or small the business is, well, I don't want it to be all about me. I don't want people to think mm. that it's all about me. And the truth is you can come at it from an all about me perspective. A far better way to come at it and a more successful way to come at it is just from this perspective of contribution. Mm. What do I have to contribute that will be helpful to the people I'm trying to influence? And whether you do that as a presentation on the stage, whether you do that as a book, whether you do that as a course, however you do that, I mean, you guys come at it from that perspective. What can we contribute that's going to build a community around us that are also really fascinated in the same things that mm. we are fascinated in? Mm. There's, um, oh, sorry, go on. Oh, no, I would love to hear what you got to say. I was going to tell a quick story about Mata Nurses. So when my when my daughter was born, you know, I kind of, there's that moment where you leave the hospital and you just had that horrible realization that you have no idea what you're doing. Mm. And <laughs> I realized that I had thought that all newborns came out the same size, which seems perfectly reasonable to me, but apparently they don't. Apparently they come out different sizes. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't have any nappies. And I went to, I went to a local supermarket and there was this wall of nappies, just a wall of them. And 
I'm stood there and I'm sleep deprived and overwhelmed and in this world where I just, I have no expertise at all. And I suddenly saw Marta nappies, which were, so Marta, for those of you who don't know, Marta hospitals, Marta nurses, and they had come out with their own brand of nappies. Now I had been listening to taking advice from nurses not just not just Martinez's, although I had certainly been reading some of their articles as well, for the past 12 months. They had been contributing to my world for 12 months. They had become the translator. I, you know, I'm a big believer in that and becoming the translator of your space. So they had become the translator of my world, you know, like what kills babies? Okay, well, here's the things that you should actually worry about as opposed to the thousand things that you are worrying about. You know, they had become these translators for me. And so when it came time for me to put my dollars on the line when it came time for me to pick a product it was a no-brainer I'm going to pick pick their product because they have become the translators of this space for me they've contributed to my world and now I trust them Mm. now they could it was the smartest thing in the world for them to release a range of nappies and I'm sure that they have range of of a hundred other things in the baby world as well because once you earn that trust and once you've contributed to a level with consistency what happens is I I want to buy things from you. I want you to tell me, you know, I want you to have taken all the information and distilled it down into this is as good as a nappy gets. Here you go. So not only is it the smartest way to sell anything, it's actually a gift at that stage. You know, if you've contributed enough to somebody's world for them to go, oh, can you just, can you just put a product together just to help me? Because mm. now I trust you and I would buy it in a second and it would be a service to me if you would do that. Mm. Yeah, that's very much that natural next step that I sort of feel like happens. And, and yes, people are grateful to get this next thing from you. And yeah, it's a joyful, as you say, I like the choice of word joyful. I want to pivot a little bit because one of the other inside, one of the other influences you talked about was inside influence. And I'd love to just talk about that for a moment because we find this role, this role confidence plays in our ability to put ourselves out there, to lay claim to that phrase, hey, I am an influencer, hey, I have got something to say, is an important thing. And I'd love you to speak a little bit in terms of this idea of inside influence about the role confidence plays in our ability to influence others. Oh, I hate the word confidence. It's my, <laughs> oh, it's my least favourite word. I think I, I've over the years I've, I've built up a, an aversion to the world because I hear it used Mm. as a reason to not take a step forward so mm. many times. I think that what I have noticed over the years and what, you know, one of those things that I know to be true, it's that confidence doesn't arrive. It never arrives. I've never once seen it arrive. It's not this, you know, magical, mythical thing that one day you wake up and it's just there. And I, you hear people say, I'll do that when I'm feeling more confident. And unfortunately, you know, well, unfortunately, confidence is something that happens in motion. You know, confidence shows up when we show up over and over and over again. And a better thing to strive for if you're looking to start out rather than wait for confidence, forget confidence. Honestly, by the time confidence arrives, you'll have done it so many times you don't even need it anymore. So just just forget it. Mm. A better thing to focus on is the ability to be able to speak with certainty because confidence is confidence is an upward motion. Like if you look at the sensation in your body, confidence goes upwards. It's a rush of adrenaline. It's a, you know, a moment of feeling, you know, whew, I'm doing lots of hand gestures here. You can't see any of them. So <laughs> it's that it's that upward sensation. Alternatively, speaking with certainty feels very different. Speaking with certainty is a downward sensation. The Spanish call it duende, which is when you see a flamenco dancer take the stage, everything goes quiet. And there's that moment before they start dancing where they just ground down, where gravity just seems to grab them. And they, they say that in that moment, the duende has arrived. And it's that sensation when you root your body down to the ground and you claim your space, you own your space. And then you speak with the best that you have in that moment. And that's the distinction in that moment. This is the best that I have given all of my experience, given everything I have learned today, given all the roads that my journey has brought me to, this is the best that I have. And I will give it to you with everything that I have. And if tomorrow I find out that I was wrong or I get a new piece of information, I will change my mind. But in this moment, this is the best I have. 
And so that is speaking with certainty. doesn't mean you're certain. doesn't mean you're right, because that's another thing that stops primarily women in my mm. experience. The what if somebody else in the room knows more than I do? Or what if I'm wrong? Or what if, you know, what if someone asks me a question and I don't know the answer? So it's speaking with certainty is claiming your ground. I give you the best that I have with all the experience that I have, which no one else in this room has the combination of experiences that I bring to this. And I will give it to you out of pure contribution. And I'm not attached. I'm not certain. I'm not defensive. I'm not closed. I'm not attached to having to be right. And therefore, I'm able to speak from a place of absolute gravity as opposed to fear. It's just a different sensation. Hmm, I've so, never heard about it talk that way before. It's really interesting. Yeah, it's a, yeah, confidence is just one of those. I think it's such a myth that we get fed that confidence is going to arrive, that confidence is going to show up. I mean, there's people I know who, who speak hundreds of times a year and have done for 10 plus years who you want to see them backstage before they, before they get on. They're pacing, you know, but they get on and they speak with an incredible amount of certainty. So, yeah, confidence shows up. Unfortunately, it's too, it's too late when confidence shows up. Hopefully you're already on the stage. <laughs> All right. We're going to pick up the pace a little bit here. I want to ask you about tough crowds. <laughs> so what if we're wanting to influence in an area where perhaps our idea is new, very out of the box, hasn't been done the way before, you know, or it could be that we're really asking people to make a huge leap, to make a big change in behavior or thinking, or it could even be that we're trying to sell something that nobody really needs. You know, it might be a luxury item or something whimsical. And so we meet resistance for any of those reasons when we try and influence. Is there something we would be doing different when we have this tough crowd? So are you talking about those moments where that most salespeople would have come across where you walk in, you think this, <laughs> this, is, not, this is not a friendly room? The correct, correct. Yeah. I think that going straight to it, what, naming the elephant in the room can be one of the most powerful things you can do in those moments. Because what happens is if there's an elephant in the room, i.e. this unspoken resistance in the room, what tends to happen is while I'm having a conversation with myself in my head about you or about mm. your product, I'm not listening to you. I can't. I can't talk to myself and listen to you at the same time. It's physically impossible. And so if you speak it respectfully, so it might be, you know, that you get on stage or you walk into the room and you go, look, I know there might be a perception here that this product is, you know, you might be asking yourselves, why on earth would I need this product? I've got a thousand just like mm. them and I never wear those. You know, you've removed the elephant and now all of a sudden I'm listening because I'm like, oh, wow, she actually knows what's going on in my head. Okay, I'm open now. So speak to the elephant in the room if you can. Move it out of the way. Awesome. Sometimes the only way to move an elephant out of the way if you're in an, a, a situation that's it's possible to be interactive is to ask some questions. You know, who here has seen this before? Yes. Who here has some thoughts on this area, who has used it and has some feedback. So you can you can always use interaction as another way to get elephants out of the room. But yeah, I would first off get it out of the room. And then secondly, I would move into co-creating as far as possible. So get curious. If you can feel a room get hostile for whatever reason or an interaction get hostile, never get defensive, just get really curious. So, you know, tell me about your experiences. Tell me, you know, what if it looked like this? Could it be different? What if it was, what if it was green and blue with yellow polka dots? How would that feel? Would that be different? In what situation do you think that would, so just get very curious. And the more curious you get, the more people feel heard, the less hostile rooms and individuals mm. tend to be. I love that. That's such good advice. I mean, there was about five things there that you rattled off that I just think if somebody took that one piece and applied it next time they're in a tough sales situation or about to speak to a tough crowd, they're going to really see a transformation. Oh, I've literally been in a room talking to a very, very early on in my journey while someone was asleep on the table. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> That's a tough crowd right there. That was, it, that was a particularly tough crowd. Particularly it's about as tough, tough as crowd. they get. Uh, at least they weren't asleep throwing tomatoes at the same time. No, uh, and the only thing I can say in my defense is they were asleep before I started talking. So I don't think I put big, them to sleep. Julie, the big question, did you wake them up? I did. <laughs> and were they pleased to be awake is probably a better question. <laughs> Look, there's a great question you ask at the start of your podcast, and I'm always intrigued 
by the answers that people give. And the question you ask is each guest that you have, you, you say, you ask them, do they consider themselves to be an introvert or an extrovert? And I know, you know, it's often considered that being influential is more the domain of the extrovert. And so what do you have to say about that? And what have you learned about the power of introverts to influence? I'm glad you like the question because it's actually, mm. I'm wondering whether to keep it or not at the moment. So that's good feedback for me. I started asking it because I noticed that there was a there was a general myth out there that the people who made an impact, people who are compelling, people who would stand up and be counted were had to be extroverts. You know, I can't possibly do that. I'm an introvert and he's an extrovert, she's an extrovert, that's why she can do it. And it was interesting to me because that was the exact opposite to my experience. You know, my experience working with thought leaders and working with people who wrote best-selling books, people who took to the stage in front of tens of thousands of people was that they tended to be introverts, actually. And the worst thing as their manager that, or their agent that I could do, the thing that they would hate me for, them, I could put them in front of a room of 50,000 people, they'd be happy as pie. If I put them in a room with 10 people and they had to talk, just make general conversation, that's it. They would be livid about that. And it's not because they didn't want to talk to people, it's just because they were so introverted that that was their idea of hell, of having to, you know, having to talk one-on-one. Mm. And... What I've learned is that introverts are actually incredibly powerful. Extroverts are powerful for obvious reasons. They stand up. They're very good at raising their voice. They tend to be quite charismatic. So, you know, our eyes are drawn to them naturally. So you could say that they're born with a little bit more foundational skill. However, some of the most compelling people I have ever met have been introverts because there is something about the quietest person in the room. And you've ever noticed when you walk into a room, you can always tell who the leader is because it's the person that doesn't say anything. There's just, again, this gravity to people who aren't necessarily extroverts, but when they do speak, they have listened hard enough to make it well worth your while listening to them. They tend to be very curious. They tend to be people that observe everything. They tend to be people who are able to join dots together that other people can't see. And when they speak, they're the, just you know, the room goes silent. And so I think that there is an incredible power to being an introvert. And if you want to see it in action, there's this amazing TED Talk, Megan Washington, who's this Emmy Award winning singer and gets up on stage and tries to do a TED Talk. And she has a profound stutter and she never once looks up. She reads it off her iPhone. She never looks up. So she breaks every rule in my you know, world of, of how to speak on stage. She doesn't move. She never looks up. And she reads off her iPhone. And yet she is so, you can't take, it's incredible. You can't take your eyes off her. She is so compelling. Mm, we're going to have to put because, a link to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do, just watch it and watch for the gravity of her. And it is because she has thought about what she's going to say. It's because she's insightful. It's because she's honest. It's because she owns, just owns her space. Yeah. So there's a power to being an introvert that when it is focused, I think you will find that, you know, a lot of the CEOs, a lot of the gurus that you admire, they're all introverts. Mm. I remember reading that a lot of, yeah, a lot of leaders, a lot of performers, musicians, artists, actors, you know, are similarly introverts if you were to ask them. And when it comes to something that you've got a great deal of experience in, and that is helping speakers and people present and be more influential, Something that would be really relevant for our audience to hear from you on is when they are, whether they're introverts or extroverts, but when they're doing some kind of a live presentation, whether that's a live cast or a Facebook Live or actually getting on stage at an industry event or even doing a presentation in front of a you know group of people where one person might be asleep. <laughs> Hopefully no one else ever comes across that situation. <laughs> what would be your top three tips for creating and delivering more influential live presentations? I think that the, the first thing that you do before you, what, what most people tend to do is they look at, right, what do I want to say? And that's the wrong question to start it with. The most powerful question you can ask is, what do I want this audience to think, feel, do or believe differently as a result of hearing me speak than they did when they walked in? If you start with that question, that then shapes and forms your entire presentation. And so if you have a list of things you want them to think, feel, do, believe differently, all right, so if that's what you want, if that's your intention, 
what's the most compelling case you can make for that? Is it a story? Because stories are incredibly powerful. We, we tend to only really act via story as a result of hearing stories. There's a lot of incredible research on that now, the, the difference between our actions when faced with statistics as opposed to, as opposed to stories. And Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth is an, an amazing example of that alone. You know, the scientific community had been trying for decades to get us to pay attention to what was going on in the environment and in, in climate change. And Al Gore told this incredible story for an hour. And I think the people who bought emissions offsets just went up by, it was about 25%, I think I can find out the exact statistic. So once you've figured those things out, what's the most compelling way for you for you to do that? Is it a story? Is it a case study? Is it a statistic? And it just flips your thinking away from what do I want to say, which is a debilitating question to begin with. And it starts getting your, your thinking really structured. Hmm. So that's the first thing. That's so I just want thing. to repeat that. So what do I want them yep. to think, feel, do or believe differently as a result of my As a result of seeing me speak mm. that they didn't before. So that's that's one. The second thing just on a purely technical level is you need to set the energy up early and get if you're not a, a particularly confident person or you wouldn't consider yourself to be an extrovert, get something else to do the heavy lifting for you. Start your presentation with a video. Walk onto stage to some music. Start with some interaction, get on stage, have the first thing you say here, who here, you know, I'll go back to the fashion example, who here has more clothes in their wardrobe than they know what to do with, or who here has only wore approximately 25% of the shoes that they own. Get the audience to move, to put their hand up, to think, to engage. And you'll have gone 90% of the way of owning that room by then in the first five minutes. So get tailored, get structured with the information you want to give, own the energy early and use whatever vehicles you can to get that energy up. So rather than you dragging it up over the first 20 minutes, do something up front that's going to lift that energy and then you ride off that. The third thing is what's the one thing? And and I ask that question at the end of each podcast episode for a reason. And, and it's usually if I were to ask you, there's one thing, one thing that you want this room to do or no. And the truth is, if you've got an hour in front of a room, they're only you, you'll be lucky if they do one. So get really clear about what you want it to be. Don't leave it to luck or accident or somebody joining the dots. What's the one thing? And then say it. You know, as a result of my presentation, I'd really like to invite you to. I'd really like to dare you to. I'm going to leave you with one request, and it's this. It kills me, especially in the not-for-profit sector, how many times they have mastered the art of epic storytelling but they fall short of giving anything practical for somebody to do to help. So, you know, dolphin friendly tuna was, was fantastic. One thing, buy tuna with this symbol on it, done. Rest of my life, done. Easy for mm. me to do. I was watching a documentary about whales a while ago and I watched this whole hour. I was that engaged. I watched it for an hour and I was just, my heart was broken by the end of it and I would have done anything. And the documentary just finished. Credits rolled. And I had no idea what to do. I had no idea. And I would have done anything. Mm. So what is the one thing you want them to do? And ask it. Say it, dare it, invite it, whatever language you want to use. Julie, as we wrap up this beautiful, generous interview that you've given us, I'd like to invite you to share your one thing with our audience. What would you like to leave us with? Oh, that came out of left field. Um, <laughs> What's I just listening thing? to you, I feel like you've got this one thing. If, if the listener could walk away from today with just one thing that you've already said maybe, what is it? What's the one thing you want them to, to do to take with them from this interview? I think that the one thing would, would be something that I've already said. The one thing is that you know influence only shows up when we show up again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And there's a saying in my field which is to get match fit. And wherever you feel like you're not fit right now, whatever story you're telling yourself about why you haven't started writing an article, doing videos, speaking, whatever it is, there'll be one, I'm sure, that you've got a story around. Just commit yourself to showing up and getting match fit in that one area. And it could be that you, every Monday morning, you make a two-minute video on your iPhone. 
you don't do anything with it, but you just commit to making a two minute video. So you get used to it. You get better. You get better able to craft it. You notice what you do with your hands. You notice what you do with your voice. Then maybe send it to somebody else that you trust and get their feedback, but get match fit because nobody has ever been born good at this stuff. Nobody that I have met anyway. No one's ever been born confident. No one's ever been born a natural influencer. It starts with a decision to show up. It starts with a decision to get match fit. I love it. Influence shows up when we show up. And I want to thank you so much today for showing up so generously and demystifying for us about what it means to be influential and what it means to be an influencer in our space. It's been such a pleasure having you on the Content Sales Podcast. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much for inviting Julie on the show. I absolutely love that. Oh, it was a pleasure. She's such a she's such a gem and, and I've known her for quite a long time and been, you know, watching her mastery unfold. And I'm so glad she's finally been able to come onto the show. Mm, I can't wait to check out the podcast, which I haven't had a listen to yet. And what I want to do before we sign off for today and give people the details of the gift from Julie and tell them what's coming up is maybe just pull out a couple of things, Michelle, that you are taking away from the interview. And I've noted Mm. a couple of things as well. Mm. Yeah, look, I mean, I madly was taking notes while Julie was speaking, I, I've, I haven't counted them up, but I've got several pages of notes here. <laughs> uh, there were so many good, good things. And a lot of them are things that kind of reiterate a lot of the core ideas we hear on the show. And I think if anybody's been listening for a while, you'll start to see a pattern here between all of our guests. They're often talking about making a contribution and being in service with their content. And that theme came up very much today. I think the two two key ideas I did want to sort of share or pull out of the the conversation were the thing Julie said at the beginning about the three types of influence. And I thought that was very insightful because so often it's about that external sort of, you know, the the persona that shows up. And I think uh, she really put her finger on something that's really important because there's inside influence. You know, the inner game is so powerful when it comes to how influential we can be. Then there's the interpersonal influence and then there's industry influence. So that inside influence, interpersonal and industry influence. So what's going on on the inside of us in our mindset, then how we are influencing other people in terms of, you know, one-to-one or one-to-sort of small group or one-to-large group settings, and then how we are in our whole industry space. And there are really three areas I think we want to be mindful of as content marketers. Mm, love all those, especially she made a comment about people who are influencers and their ability, mm. like their inner work, they've done their inner mm-hmm. work, like they know who they are, they've uh, got that bit handled, so it's not just external. And I think that's where, anyway, I could go down a little rabbit hole <laughs> about mm, that. But, but it's but, so true. Mm. No, you're, you're right. It is. And, and most of the people that I know that are true influencers that I know up close and personal, like you said, they've done that inner work. Mm. On the similar sort of level uh, was the comment that Julie made about influence only shows up when you show up. Mm. And I really love that because it's really hard to influence, to make a difference to our customers, to our industry, to the causes that we're passionate about if we don't show up, if we don't put Mm. ourselves on the line, if we don't build our communication skills, if we don't take that action and do what it takes to actually show up and say, this is what I stand for, this is what I believe, this is the impact I want to make. And I really love that. And you and I are both very much about supporting women, especially in really Mm. showing up. So I felt like it was, yeah, I really love that. Mm. Yeah, she had some great things, I think, to dimensionalize what showing up looks like too for all of us and being grounded and not necessarily having to know all the answers, Mm. but just speak with certainty with what we know right now. I thought that was great. The other thing that I wanted to point out, and I have not really heard too many other people explain it this way, and I just love to hear a new idea that makes me go, oh, I love that thought, was when Julie said, you know, being an influencer is having the power to say, hey, look over there and having enough people, a significant number of people actually look over there. And, you know, that I guess is the essence of influencing behavior. Hey, look over there and people look over there. But what she said was what they're looking at is the brand. And so it's this distinction now where the brands used to control what we looked at. You know, there was one television show and one set of ads and one mainstream newspaper and the brands really did control what we looked at. But now it's individuals saying, hey, look over there. 
And so as a company, we need, as our own brand, we need to realize that we have to be the influencers pointing people back to our brand, that we have to be telling stories and putting out information that's going to capture people's attention before we can point them to our brand. Mm. Yeah, so many unique There were um, a number of things that I'd not heard someone talk about in the way that Julie did. I really appreciated that. And one of those things, which is, again, a totally different way to talk about something that we talk about often on the podcast is this idea of really knowing your ideal client and really walking in their shoes. And she used the term charismatic language, and that was the idea of using the language that your audience uses because that builds connection to them and I thought that is so easy to get wrong and it's actually not that hard to do if we really listen. You know, and some of those clues are in what they're saying when they when we ask in surveys or what they're saying when they're asking questions of our customer service channels or there is so many ways to actually get that language and Michelle you know that we've been very much looking at that. How mm. do our customers describe the problems they have? How do they describe the services we offer or our products or the outcomes that they want? And really being attuned to that and developing that language is so powerful in this area of influence. Totally. It's work that we want to be doing that pays off time and time again in our business. It's like one piece of core work that we want to do that we can use then for every other piece of communication. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Mm. So we mentioned a couple of times we teased you with the idea that Julie's given us a free resource for you and she's done this very generously. It's really great. It's called the Influencer Code eBook, which is a great name. And it's all about how you can become the leading authority in your space, which is so important if you want to be an influencer. And in it, Julie takes you through the core disruptions that we talked about. We mentioned there were five, so she outlines all of those in detail. And these are things that you need to know about to really harness your own influence and be seen as an authority. So I highly recommend you grab it. You'll find it over on our website at herbusiness.com forward slash influencer code. Herbusiness.com forward slash influencer code. And on that page, you'll see the show notes from today and you'll also see the link to go ahead and download that as a PDF. Once again, thank you so much to Julie. Now, there is a listener that I want to give a shout out to, and that is Natalie Rivett, who Michelle left a message on our Facebook page. Short, sharp, sweet message (laughs) (laughs) to say, thank you. Love listening to your podcast while I'm running. Keep Mm. up the great work. I love listening to podcasts when I'm running too. Mm. So, Natalie, thank you so much for taking the time to write. Really appreciate it. And I hope you're listening to this one. So if you are a regular listener or this is your first time, we would love to share the tips that our guests like Julie bring to the show with as many business owners as possible. So we would love it if you enjoyed today or any of our episodes, if you would leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, that would be awesome. Michelle, what do we have coming up in episode 80? Episode 80. Wow, that's amazing. (laughs) We are doing an episode uh, next episode is all about five ways to build a stronger connection with your customers. And it's a really good follow on, I think, from what Julie shared with us today, because as we've seen so much about being influential is about creating that connection. And so we're going to dig into some specific things that you can be doing to build that connection with your customers. And I think it's going to follow on very, very nicely from some of the ideas we've heard today. So that's coming up in two weeks' time. And if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, do, because then it'll automatically download as soon as it's available. Michelle, anything you want to say before we go? I definitely recommend you check out the Inside Influence podcast. I think it's a great piece of work that Julie's doing. And, yeah, just remembering for all of us, and this is as much for me as anybody else, is that influence shows up when we show up. So here's to showing up, everybody. Mm, Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time on the Content Cells podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. 